Well, Phineas, thank you for joining us in the uh, Arctic Base Camp Science Jamboree. You and Billy have been really vocal about climate change and the dangers of extreme weather events like the recent California wildfires. When did you start to learn about climate change and first become truly concerned about it? It's been definitely at the forefront of my mind the last four years, specifically because under maybe previous uh, government uh, responses, I was I was maybe like a little more complacent, thinking like maybe the right thing is being done. And then I think when it's very clear that those people are not in charge anymore, you're like, oh, I really want to make sure that I'm paying attention to this. So better to align oneself, I think, with science. I also think that one of the counter arguments to like scientific discovery is like, well, they've been wrong before. And I'm always excited when when I say something that I heard a year ago and some friend of mine goes, oh, actually, that's they've totally proven that wrong now. Like, oh, crazy. So you and Billy have also been really vocal about vegetarianism, its connection, especially to the environment. Can you tell us a little bit about your feelings about the benefits of being vegan and its connection to climate change? We were raised um, vegetarian, which just made it all the easier. I mean, if you, if you're not, um, accustomed to a dietary routine that you're then shifted from, you're just, you know, this has always been innate, but you know, I think as we became more and more aware of factory farming industry and its impact on the planet, it became even more of a no brainer to me that meat restrictions and limitations uh, you know, are really important. I talk to friends sometimes who are like, you know, oh, I like I, I want to be vegan, but I just can't give up chicken. And I, I'm i always like, well, maybe you should start by just being a vegan who eats chicken. Like maybe you should just cut everything else out and eat that and, and just realize that you've reduced, you know, 80% instead of 100%. And mm-hmm. I, I just am a big believer in in progress over like totality. I think any step in the right direction is an important step as opposed to thinking like I'm not possibly doing enough. Just like, well, I'm making progress. So I want to bring on a real actual scientist, Gail, Dr. Gail Whiteman, founder of Arctic Base Camp. Hi, Rain. Hi, Phineas. Hey, it's nice to meet you. Phineas, it's your dream come true. You You get to ask anything you want about the Arctic or about climate change. This is your great opportunity. The, the most important thing I think I could learn is what to you is the most, you know, or, or some of the most important knowledge to be had? Oh, that's a good question. So the drum roll would be climate science is real um, and it has a lot of rigor to it. And the evidence is convincing and that human made climate change is related to CO2 emissions. Right. And that will affect how we grow our food, how we live our life, how we survive. And there's really only one way to fix that, and that is to reduce CO2 emissions. And we have to reduce half of those by 2030 mm-hmm. and it then get to net zero by 2050. And then the second point I would say would relate to the Arctic. So that's the work that we do at Arctic Base Camp. And the Arctic is really the poster child of climate change because that's where it is warming the fastest, about two to three times the global average. And it is basically the barometer that says we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. It's also related to extreme weather events, so it affects everything around the world. But the news is not good, but it doesn't mean that we can't fix it. There's still time left. In terms of fixing it, are the solutions in existence or are they being invented? Yeah, so a lot of them are in existence. So if, for example, we phase out a coal six times faster than we are, if we scale up renewables five times faster and we get more electric vehicles 22 times faster than we are, we go a long way to starting to fix those things. So we need innovation, but actually a lot of the stuff, a lot of the stuff is out there. Not under the the norm of um, a pandemic. My job entails... Um, a pretty high carbon footprint. We we have to fly all over the world all the time. We have huge trucks following us everywhere, carrying our our show equipment. We've done you know um, some work to try to offset that. We work with a really wonderful company called Reverb that helps okay. reduce our footprint. And um, I guess my question to you, as a more broad statement than just my own life, but like a person who like forced to do something that is not as eco friendly. Do you have sort of 
solutions for ways to offset that in the most effective way? Yeah, so there's various offsetting groups that are out there that do help to reduce emissions globally. So the UN, for example, when they brought in the Youth Climate Summit, they had a very specific program that they worked with to offset those emissions. So it's all about how do we reduce our emissions? So if you wanted to align with the global plan, it could be like, so what do you do in 2030? How could you reduce your emissions by half? And if you get your fan base or your peer groups to do the same, then that's great. Mm. So it's not about being perfect. It's about trying. Mm -hmm. I love that. That was a, a bevy of questions, Finis. You need to have your own like climate podcast. That was amazing. You're grilling me, I know. Phineas O'Connell, Dr. Gail Whiteman, thank you so much for joining this little mini panel. And thanks for joining us on Make Earth Cool Again, an Arctic Base Camp Science Jam. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Phineas. Thanks, Rain.